Hey, Mike here. I just wanted to let you know that you can listen to Dark Poutine early and ad-free on Amazon Music, included with Prime. Welcome back to Dark Poutine. I'm Mike Brown. Uh, across the table from me, as per usual, is my good friend Matthew. Say hello, Matthew. Uh, hello, Matthew. Um, and I didn't mean it that way. Hi, everybody. Good. <laughs> good! <laughs> he takes direction. He's hired. The views, information, and opinions expressed during the Dark Poutine podcast are solely those of the producer and do not necessarily represent those of Curious Cast, its affiliate, Global News, nor their parent company, Chorus Entertainment. Dark Poutine is not for the faint of heart or squeamish. Our content is often intense and some listeners may find it disturbing. We are not experts on the topics we present, nor are we journalists. We are ordinary Canadian schmucks chatting about crime and the dark side of history. Let's get to it. Put on your toque, grab yourself a double-double and an Nanaimo bar. It's time to scarf down some dark poutine. Two all-beef host special Steve, good eggs, cheese, bad apples, all in a sesame seed bun. Oh, of course you gotta have the bun. The bun's the best bit. No, it's not. <laughs> so bready. <laughs> When I was visiting Nova Scotia over Christmas, I was reminded of a case that we had yet to look at on this show, one that has always been on my to-do list. Now's the time to take this one off and have a good look at a crime that seems so out of place for my tiny home province. This is a big city crime that took place in a small town. On May 7, 1992, after the McDonald's restaurant on Kings Road near Celtic Drive in Sydney River, Nova Scotia closed for the night, and the overnight crew was coming in and the evening crew was leaving. Three young men, armed with a shovel handle, knives, and a twenty-two caliber pistol robbed the establishment. They beat, stabbed, and shot four of the restaurant workers, killing three, Jimmy Fagan, 27, Donna Warren, 22, and Neil Burroughs, Jr., 29. They critically wounded 20-year-old Arlene McNeil, who was permanently disabled both physically and mentally, requiring round-the-clock care until her death in 2018. The crime's brutality brought some unwelcome international media attention to the small town, especially when the truth came out. To almost everyone's surprise, days after the murders, it quickly became evident that the brutal crime had been committed by three fairly well-liked young men from the area. They'd robbed the place for its cash, making off with a tiny fraction of what they'd assumed would be in the restaurant's safe. You are listening to Dark Patine, episode 203, The Sydney River McDonald's Shooting. Some of the details in this episode come from Fonce Jessam's book, Murder at McDonald's, The Killers Next Door. Jessam is a veteran Canadian reporter and television correspondent. He was raised in Sydney, Nova Scotia, and has covered crime and politics in Canada since the early 1990s. His insightful and detailed book on the case is told in a way that only a Maritimer could. I highly recommend you reading it if you're looking for a deeper understanding of what happened that night and afterward. I'm from a small town, Bridgewater, which, according to the 2016 census, is home to just over 8,500 people. In contrast, Sydney River, where the murders took place, is a suburb to the southwest of the Cape Breton city of Sydney and is home to just over 3,100 people. But the area is growing just like the rest of the province. In 1992, the economy of Nova Scotia was in a slump and things on Cape Breton Island had taken a downward turn. Local industry was on the decline, coal mining was slowing down, and Sydney Steel Corporation Cisco was struggling under the provincial government's ownership, who were looking to sell the losing venture as steel purchasers went elsewhere. There were fewer jobs, 
and the young people graduating from high school and going to trade schools and universities were feeling hopeless. Like, where am I going to work? No longer could they count on a lifelong job in a mine or factory like their parents had had. Youngsters looked to gigs that paid minimum wage or slightly better to help pay their way until they figured out what they really wanted to do with their lives or could save enough to go off to school and get an education. Some worked at grocery stores, like myself, while others took jobs at the fast food restaurants that were springing up in communities all over the province. Many folks I know had their first real jobs working behind the counter or in the kitchen of a local McDonald's restaurant. It was there that many young people learned how to be good employees. Many can still recall the phrase, if you've got time to lean, you've got time to clean. After the close of the restaurant at midnight on May 7, 1992, there were four employees left inside the Sydney River McDonald's. Arlene McNeil, Donna Warren, Neil Burroughs Jr., and Derek Wood. A fifth, Jimmy Fagan, was due to arrive later. Arlene McNeil and Donna Warren were a couple of those who saw working at the Sydney River McDonald's as a means to make their way toward brighter futures. According to Fonce Jessam's book, quote, For Arlene McNeil, McDonald's was a place to earn enough money to go to university where she hoped to get a degree, maybe in business administration. Donna Warren's job would eventually pay the tuition for law school in Halifax, end quote. Some folks found in McDonald's what they'd hoped might make them a career. This was so for both Jimmy Fagan and Neil Burroughs, again from Jessam's book, quote, Jimmy Fagan felt the restaurant was his best chance to keep working year-round in an area where many people couldn't even secure seasonal work. As for Neil Burroughs, he was probably going to be at the restaurant the longest. The 29-year-old relied on McDonald's to help support his wife and child. The pay at McDonald's didn't provide many luxuries for Neil, his wife Julia, and their son Justin, but his pay combined with Julia's income from a hairdressing job kept the family going. And they were living where they wanted to at home, close to their parents, siblings, and friends, end quote. Do you remember those days, Mike? No, <laughs> I don't remember those no, days. No, when, when you were young and sort of the jobs you'd take. Yeah, yeah. You know, it's, it's fascinating. It's um, around this time, I was just starting in advertising, but do you remember the singer Jane Sibri? I do. Mimi on the beach. Yeah, she had a song that went, and I was a waiter, so I got out of college mm -hmm. as a waiter, Mm -hmm. But I'd gone to college for advertising and I wasn't in the industry. And Jane Sibri had this song that went, I'd probably be famous now if I wasn't such a good waitress. Oh, there you go. And I was like, oh no. And I was a really good waiter, right? <laughs> so, so I actually like, um, took a job for free saying, if you win a new client and you can afford me, take me on, I help them win. And I, my first advertising job, the grand total Dizzying heights of 15,000 Canadian a year, which is like for the Americans, it's about $7.95 a year. Yeah, that's pretty much it. Well, 15 grand in the early 90s was not good. <laughs> no, no, it wasn't, right? No. It's, it's like it wasn't 1865. But, you know, the thing about these people, mm -hmm. right? You know, a lot of, I know some people like look down on food service workers. Yeah. But I'm like, I don't get that because for me, if somebody's like working, to either save money to better themselves or to like look after their families. I have respect for them. I don't care what you do. It, it, working at all, you're contributing something. Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. Derek Anthony Wood had dropped out of high school and needed something to do. So McDonald's was, in his mind, pretty much his only option. He'd only recently started at the restaurant. According to Jessam's book and other sources, Wood was not very talkative and always seemed to have a dark cloud hanging over his head. Friends indicated Derek had been struggling since his parents' divorce and his mom had subsequently moved out west. His father, who worked at the Sobe store just down the road from McDonald's, had remarried and he and his new wife had begun to have children. Derek was depressed and at one point in the months before the main events of this story, Police had been called when Derek was drunk, distraught, and threatening to kill himself while at a weekend training outing at the Cape Breton Militia District. After the incident, Derek was removed from the militia and his training went incomplete. The others at the restaurant thought Derek was not a bad guy, just a little weird. That night after his shift, Derek changed into his street clothes and made some phone calls that went unanswered. 
He propped the basement door of the restaurant open using his kit bag and then left the property. He walked toward the Tim Hortons restaurant across the street adjacent to the Cape Breton Shopping Center, where he was going to meet his friends, Freeman McNeil, 23, and Darren Muse, 18. They were waiting for him in a Chevy Impala parked beside a payphone. It was that phone Derek had been calling, but his buddies hadn't heard it ringing. Things were not going to the plan the three had concocted. The idea was that McNeil and Muse would be signaled by Wood's phone call. They would then drive to the bypass road beside the restaurant and creep through the door Derek had propped open for them and rob the place with their inside man, Derek Wood, pretending to be another victim. They thought the small handgun, knives, and shovel handle would intimidate restaurant workers into compliance, Darren and Freeman both had martial arts training as well, and would, they thought, have no trouble with one man and two women. No real violence would be necessary. The trio of wannabe robbers had hoped to make off with $200,000 they believed would be in the safe in the restaurant's main office. They'd split the money three ways, with Derek planning on taking off to BC to be a drug runner for a biker gang. They'd initially wanted to involve a fourth in their plot, but that guy had backed out at the last minute. So these guys sound like a bunch of winners, Mike. Mm -hmm. Why would there be $200,000 in a safe in a McDonald's in Sydney River, New Brunswick? Nova Scotia. Oh, I'm sorry. Yeah. <laughs> I keep saying I have New Brunswick on the mind. Yeah, I know you do. I'm going to go there soon. So the I, I looked this up. The average, while you're talking there, the average McDonald's revenue is $2.2 .2 million a year. Yep. And after everything's all paid out, a franchise owner makes about, on average, $150,000 a year. Sure. So, you know, okay, Sydney River, mm -hmm. small, as you yeah, said. Yeah, pretty small. Probably not sort of at the average, probably a bit less. Why would these guys think they're 200? No McDonald's that size would keep 200 grand in a safe. Well, it doesn't sound like they were rocket surgeons. You know? Rocket surgeons. <laughs> or brain, or brain scientists. Yeah, well, I know. Oh, well, that uh, works, actually. Yeah, it does. Yeah. Um, yeah. So, yeah, these guys are morons thinking there'd be 200 grand windfall. I, the kind of person who gets to the point where they think it's a good idea to rob a McDonald's, in particular the one that they work in. Yeah. Probably not. Not the sharpest tool in the shed. I think operative word is tool. Yeah. After Derek's departure, there were three employees left in the restaurant. Neil Burroughs, a maintenance worker, was cleaning in the kitchen. He was working the 11 p.m. to 7 a.m. shift that night. Arlene McNeil, an employee, and Donna Warren, the shift manager, were in the basement chatting and preparing to leave for the night when they were surprised, confronted by three men coming out of the darkened hallway that led toward the basement door. One of them, Darren Muse, was wearing a Halloween mask. Freeman McNeil, imposing at over six feet tall, had a shovel handle in his hand, and Derek Wood, a fellow McDonald's employee, stood in front of the women with a pistol in his hand. It must have taken a moment to register what was happening. According to Fonce Jessam's murder at McDonald's, Donna asked, What's going on? Derek Wood took a moment, looked at his accomplices, and his response to Donna's question was to raise his gun and shoot Arlene McNeil in the face at point-blank range. Donna fell to her knees beside Arlene, who now lay bleeding on the floor. Donna was screaming and crying, but otherwise frozen with fear, staying put just as she was told to do by the robbers. The bad guys ran up the stairs, knowing the only male left in the restaurant was upstairs cleaning. Neil had not heard a thing that had been going on. The concrete floor and his cleaning equipment had drowned out any sign of the fracas happening in the basement beneath him. Neil Burroughs was crouched down on one knee, cleaning in the kitchen. Derek Wood shot him in the head from behind. Burroughs collapsed, but was still alive, and then tried to get up. Darren Muse jumped on top of the wounded man and stabbed him in the neck in an attempt to slash Neil's throat and dispatch him, but it didn't kill him. As Neil begged for help, Darren Muse yelled at Freeman McNeil that his victim would not die. McNeil brutally beat Neil Burroughs in the head with a shovel handle, but Neil still moaned and asked for help. Derek Wood then shot him twice more in the head, but the third shot was not necessary. The second one had killed him. The young father was dead. 
In the meantime, Derek Wood had dragged a horrified and tearful Donna Warren upstairs and ordered her to open the safe. As soon as the safe was opened, Derek Wood shot Donna Warren in the back of the head. She collapsed on the floor as Derek went through the safe and took all the money out, putting it into a bag. It was less than the group had assumed would be there, a lot less. The proceeds would not be $200,000, but $2,017.27, a tiny fraction of the take they'd hoped for. Perhaps it was anger at the realization of the small amount of money that made Derek Wood do what he did next. As he left the office, he turned to Donna Warren, laying on the floor, bleeding, begging for help, and executed her, shooting her through the eye. The group briefly discussed returning downstairs to finish off Arlene McNeil, who still lay in the basement where she'd been shot. The trio collectively thought it was time to go. It was getting too risky. They'd been there too long. It was during this discussion, just after 1 a.m., that Jimmy Fagan arrived early for his shift. And we'll take a break right here. If you're looking for a smoking gun, I can absolutely guarantee you, you will not find it. In October 2001, a series of letters filled with a deadly powder called anthrax were dropped into the U.S. mail system. What started as an unprecedented case turned into an unsettling mystery. Who sent these deadly letters, and why? From Campside Media and Sony Music Entertainment, I'm Josh Dean, and this is Cover Up Season 4, The Anthrax Threat. Available now. And we are back. Matthew, uh, thoughts? I don't understand, Mike. Mm -hmm. Like, okay. I'm hoping in the second half that you're going to help me understand what the motive is for Mm -hmm. murdering these people and permanently maiming this woman. Yeah. Because even if there had been 200 grand there, like, why would they kill all these people? You know, get the money, get in, you know, get in, get the money, get out. Why all the bloodshed? Right. I don't understand it. Like, I'm just, I'm kind of left sort of going, why did they kill these people? Because the last thing you want to do is get cops on your ass. Right. For murdering people for a couple thousand bucks. But I think that they thought killing the witnesses, they're going to get away with everything. Ooh, dizzying heights of their criminal career. Wow. The details of what occurred next come from court documents. Quote, On May 7, 1992, Daniel McVicker was listening to the 1 a.m. radio news in his taxi while parked on the Esplanade in Sydney. Jimmy Fagan got into the cab and asked to be taken to McDonald's restaurant at Sydney River, a five to seven minute drive at the most. McVicker dropped Fagan off near a drive through window of the restaurant. As he was driving away, he heard what he described as a snap like a firecracker coming from the back of the building. He looked back and saw two people running away on the sidewalk. He could not describe them except that he thought he saw a tote bag swinging as they ran. He then drove back to the rear door of the restaurant and saw Fagan's body in the doorway. At 1.07 a.m., he radioed his dispatcher for help. John McGinnis, another taxi driver, received a call on his radio while parked on George Street in Sydney. He reached McDonald's restaurant no more than two minutes later. McVicker was in his taxi there with the doors locked. The two men went to Mr. Fagan. McGinnis rolled him over and discovered that he had been shot in the forehead but was still alive. On entering the restaurant on the main floor, he discovered Donna Warren in the office containing the safe. She was badly injured with much blood in her chest area and what appeared to be brain matter coming from her nose. She was still alive but not speaking. He then saw the body of Neil Burroughs in the kitchen area in a pool of blood. End quote. The taxi dispatcher called the RCMP detachment in Sydney at 1.09 a.m., and Corporal Kevin Cleary rushed from the detachment to the McDonald's, arriving only minutes after being dispatched. Quote, Corporal Kevin Cleary drove from the detachment and was the first officer to arrive at the scene. Within seconds, he was joined by Constable Jensen, and the officers entered the restaurant with guns drawn. They discovered Fagan, Burroughs, and Warren on the main floor. They found Arlene McNeil at the foot of the stairs leading to the basement. She was alive but seriously injured. 
The scene was exceptionally bloody and was videotaped at 3 a.m. on May 7th. Jimmy Fagan was alive, but barely, having been shot once in the forehead. He and Arlene were rushed to a nearby hospital, but Jimmy's wound was too severe and he died the next day. Arlene was hanging on, also just barely. As she slowly improved, it was evident that although she was going to pull through, she would be much the worse for wear. The bullet wound she'd received had damaged her badly, severely disabling her physically and impairing her cognitively for the rest of her life. Arlene's bright future and any hope of independence moving forward had been snuffed out in that instant where Derek Wood pulled the trigger. At 1.20 a.m., a call came into the RCMP detachment in Sydney. It was Derek Wood. He was calling from King's Convenience Store in Sydney River. Over the next three minutes, he spun his tail. He said that he had been outside McDonald's with the door open having a smoke when he heard a bang inside and fled. While Derek was spinning his load of bullshit to the cops, the two other perpetrators went to work getting rid of anything they thought would tie them to the crime. McNeil and Muse then drove to McNeil's place where they changed their clothes because they were covered in blood and the next day they were burned. While at McNeil's house, they opened the cash box recovered from McDonald's which contained only about $1,700 and some of which was given to McNeil and the rest taken by Muse. They then headed over to a girlfriend's house and, on the way, disposed of the cash box, Darren's shoes, and two knives after fingerprints had been wiped from them. Muse was taken to his home, but he did not have his keys, so he hid the money back of his house, and McNeil drove him downtown and left him at a place where his father would later pick him up. McNeil then headed for his girlfriend's house to perfect his alibi. At 3.30 a.m., the streets surrounding the McDonald's restaurant had been cordoned off by RCMP to investigate the most serious crime scene in that area up to that point and since. Constable John McDonald of the Sydney Detachment of the RCMP was directing traffic at the intersection of Kenwood Drive and Kings Road, not far from the restaurant, when he was approached by Derek Wood. According to court documents, Derek told his story again that he was, quote, at McDonald's when the shootings occurred, he had heard the shots and ran, end quote. Constable McDonald later said that Derek, quote, appeared pale and confused. McDonald asked Derek to hang around, which he did. Not leaving his assigned duty, Constable McDonald radioed for assistance with the apparent witness, and Corporal Brian Stoyek, who'd been at the crime scene since around 1.40 a.m., drove to Kenwood Drive and Kings Road to meet Derek Wood and chat with him in Stoyek's cruiser. Stoyek noticed a cut with dried blood on one of Derek's fingers on his right hand. When Stoyek inquired about the cut, Derek claimed he'd cut it the day before with a knife. Stoyek thought Derek's story about the cut seemed to be odd, as it looked much fresher and had not been cleaned or tended to in any way. The constable drove Derek back to the scene, and between 3.54 and 4.10, Derek retold his story. Stoyek took an exculpatory statement from him, in that statement, Derek Wood said that he was working at McDonald's that night from 8.30 p.m. He punched out at 12.20 a.m. He then had a smoke with another employee in the lobby, following which he assisted Arlene McNeil with some work. After changing clothes, he opened the basement door to smoke. He was on his second cigarette when he heard two gunshots and heard who he thought was Donna Warren scream. He ran from the scene arriving at King's Convenience Store, where he used the phone. He did not go home because he was, quote, too hyper. Subsequent evidence from the daily timesheets from McDonald's showed that Derek Wood punched out at 12.01, some 20 minutes before the time given in the statement, and just a little over one hour before the murders, end quote. Derek walked the officer through his supposed route after running away. Again, later that morning, Derek made more statements to Stoyak and other officers at the detachment, but they were not always consistent. His timelines were not adding up, and more details seemed to be forthcoming as the interview progressed. Derek also offered that he had used his kit bag found at the scene to prop open the basement doors, and had left it when he fled, explaining away its existence there. However, evidence found at the restaurant by way of footprints indicated that the perpetrators had entered through the basement door. One of them had been wearing Reebok sneakers, 
The tread pattern was later discovered to match the sneakers that Derek had been wearing and were subsequently booked into evidence. There were other inconsistencies, too. The basement door was very difficult to close from the outside, as Wood had led the police to believe he had done. No cigarette butts could be found outside the door in the area where Derek said that he had discarded at least one butt. And there was the cut on Derek's finger that appeared too fresh to have occurred the day previous. At 1.10 p.m. that afternoon, Derek Wood was arrested for two charges of attempted murder, two charges of murder, and one of armed robbery. Before asking for a lawyer, Derek Wood made a few statements. And after speaking with his lawyer, he talked some more. At one point before speaking with his lawyer, Wood said, I don't know as much as you think I know. I don't know where the gun is. End quote. Again, his story changed. Derek was now claiming he had walked around in front of the Tim Hortons before returning to the McDonald's. Perhaps trying to explain away his footprints, he now said that he went back in through the basement door and locked it. He said that it was then that he heard a single shot and didn't hear any screams. From court documents, here's one of the RCMP members present recounting Derek Wood's story. Quote, he said he kept walking inside and then he saw Arlene on the floor near the basement stair door leading to the upper floor. He said he opened this door. When he looked upstairs, he could see two fellows running out of the garbage room door and saw a body laying on the floor at the entrance to the door. He said one fellow was carrying a kit bag and the other was wearing a mask over his head. He said he could tell it was a mask even from the back. He said he went up the stairs and went out the same door that the two fellows he saw ran out. Wood said he was running across the back lot and realized he was behind the two fellows. He could see them running towards the highway through the field. Wood said that when he realized this, that he ran around the far side of the house located on the right-hand side of McDonald's. He still maintained that he couldn't recall how he had gotten from the restaurant to the Sydney River Bridge. He stated that he was scared and that he saw the police go by while he was calling to report the incident from King's Convenience. End quote. This story seemed to be the one that Wood was now sticking to. Pending further investigation, Derek Wood was released from custody at about 7 a.m., on May 8th. News of the brutal murders flew around Nova Scotia and it was very quickly a big story in the media across the country. Everyone in the region was terrified that such a brutal crime could happen in a peaceful, typically safe and small community like Sydney River. They wanted the perpetrators to be caught swiftly, of course. Cops suspected Derek Wood's involvement, but they needed more evidence. Derek had mentioned that Freeman had dropped him off at work that night and when they talked to Freeman, his behavior was sketchy and he was evasive. He also mentioned being with Darren Muse that night. Darren was interviewed too, and his story didn't make a lot of sense either, but it was beginning to look as though the cops had their three suspects. Eight days after the murder, another man, Gregory Lawrence, an acquaintance of Derek Woods, came forward with a damning story that also implicated Freeman McNeil and Darren Muse in the crime and tied them to Derek Wood. From court documents, quote, Lawrence said that he was approached a week or two before the robbery and murders by Darren Muse at Tim Hortons on Charlotte Street in Sydney. Muse asked him to go outside where he met Freeman McNeil, whose car was parked in front of Tim Hortons. Present were Muse, McNeil, and Derek Wood. Derek Wood was sitting inside the car. As Lawrence remained outside the car, he was asked if he wanted to participate in a robbery at a place for the sum of $20,000. It was proposed that he brace an outside door and use a club to knock out anyone who tried to escape. It was anticipated that $80,000 would be obtained from the safe. The whole conversation lasted 5 to 10 minutes. Lawrence refused to get involved. Two days earlier... He had seen a duffel bag with clothes and a mask in it in Freeman McNeil's car. The next night after the robbery had been proposed to him, he saw a gun in a duffel bag in the trunk of McNeil's car. The gun was a chrome 22 caliber pistol with a wooden handle. Derek Wood, Darren Muse, and Freeman McNeil were there when he saw this gun. There was discussion about robbing McDonald's during the evening. McNeil told him that he had gotten the gun from his girlfriend's stepfather. End quote. 
Why wouldn't this guy have tipped off the police if he knew that this was happening? Well, there you go. Th this is a good question. And I kind of figured that you would ask this question mm -hmm. at this point. But if you think about it, these guys had never done anything like this before. Right. Maybe they all had uh, reputations as bullshitters. Right. You know, it's yeah. like 18 year old kids talking Ooh, about we're doing. Gonna rob a place. We're going to rob this place. It's like, yeah, yeah you're not going to do that. Oh, this guy must feel horrible for he, he has to feel horrible, yeah. which is why he came forward later, yeah. I'm sure. Well, good for him on that, right? Yeah. Yeah. After this evidence came to light, it was now time for the police to make their move. Cops had had their eyes on all three of the suspects since they'd first become aware of them. They were all arrested around the same time. Derek Wood waffled a bit at first, but he eventually made a confession. Here's part of it. Quote, All three of us were going up the stairs, and Donna and Arlene were coming out of one of the offices downstairs. We all stopped, and Donna asked what was going on. I remember looking over to Freeman and Darren and I shot Arlene. After that was over, I panicked. I ran upstairs and I shot Neil. I then went back downstairs and I got Donna and I got her to open the safe and then I shot her. I remember asking Darren to get a bag. I never had the gun after that. I put a couple of boxes of money in the bag. I grabbed the stuff and I went out the back door. Then Freeman and Darren were there. I opened up the door and I started running out. I seen Jimmy and Freeman shot him and we took off to the car. I told Freeman and Darren that I left my kit bag back there, so we drove from where we parked back to the Sydney River Bridge. I ran from there to King's Convenience Store. I called the police from there, and I called Lawrence Muller. As I said, he was home asleep. I told Lawrence that there was a shooting at McDonald's, and I asked Lawrence if he would come down and pick me up. He put me on hold, and I think he fell asleep. I then left King's Convenience Store and went on a walk. I walked up to Freeman's house and back. That is when I went up to the roadblock. That is when the RCMP officer picked me up, end quote. Mike, I like to think that if I called you and you were asleep mm -hmm. and I said there's been a shooting at my place of employ and I wanted you to come and collect me, that you wouldn't put me on hold and fall asleep. No, I wouldn't put you on <laughs> hold and fall asleep because I would be probably pretty worked up at this point. Yeah. And concerned for you. Yeah. Uh, Matthew might be hurt. <laughs> But also, I'd be concerned for myself, so I would have a lot of questions to ask you. <laughs> Namely, is the shooting still ongoing? Are you involved, Matthew? Uh, are you Are you involved in the shooting? Um, is Is if I drive there, will there be a possibility that I am I I too become shot? <laughs> do Do I need bulletproof car? Yeah. So, so I don't get that. How How did this guy like put him on hold and fall asleep? I don't know. It's very weird. Well, it was like a, a Thursday or, yeah, I guess like a Thursday more. It was like maybe, late at night. Maybe he was super high. He could have been. Smoked a big old indica doobie. And or just, it. you know, thought, oh, here's this guy again, just wound yeah. up and being weird. Okay. Just don't put me on hold, please, if I ever call you like oh, I won't. Thanks. I promise. By 11.30 on the day of the arrest, the police had obtained a full confession from Wood and a partial confession from McNeil. Muse was the last to confess. Darren Muse and McNeil also had failed polygraph tests. After talking about Arlene McNeil's shooting, Darren Muse gave his version of what happened next. Quote, I heard a shot upstairs. Derek came down and he grabbed the other woman. He took her upstairs into the office. I saw a man bleeding on the floor over by the sink. He looked at me. He was shot in the head very badly. The way he was looking at me, I don't know how to describe it. I felt like I had to help him in some way. I knew he was going to die, and I couldn't see him suffer, so I stabbed him. He stopped moving, so I thought he was dead and felt no more pain. Around this time, I heard a shot coming from the office and ran over to see what it was, and I saw Derek in the safe and a woman laid up against the wall bleeding. Freeman yelled for me to bring the gun. Derek passed me the gun. I gave it to Freeman. Derek was yelling for me. I came over with a kit bag, which I had the whole time, and he started to put the money in it. At this time, I heard a shot. I really didn't know what to do. 
We went towards the back door to leave. We got outside, and a man was standing there. I think Freeman still had the gun. I started to run away, and I heard the shot again. We ran towards the car. I didn't look back. We crossed the highway and got to the car. Then we drove towards Sydney and passed the front of the McDonald's. We noticed a taxi cab there, and Derek remembered that he left his kit bag in the doorway. We dropped him off before the Celtic Bridge. He said he would run and call the cops. Police. End quote. From a Canadian press article filed on May 19, 1992, people who knew the killers were shocked that they would ever be involved in such a thing. Quote, All three are former students of our school, said Bob McKenzie, principal of Riverview Rural High School in nearby Coxheath. They were regular students. Further on in the same article, quote, I knew Darren Muse since grade 7, said a former Riverview student who wanted to remain anonymous. He was the type of kid who wore deck shoes, baggy pants, and polo shirts. He wasn't the type of kid you would expect to be involved in this type of thing. I saw him after it happened. He was acting strangely, but I thought he was just being weird. End quote. Derek Wood was the first to go to trial. Although Arlene McNeil was alive, she was in no way capable of testifying. Her brain damage was too severe. Her mere presence in the courtroom, though, spoke volumes. Derek Wood was found guilty of first-degree murder and was given two terms of life imprisonment with parole eligibility after he'd served his full 25 years. He also got two 10-year terms for unlawful confinement and armed robbery. Freeman Daniel McNeil was found guilty of first-degree murder in the death of Jimmy Fagan and sentenced to life. He would also have to serve 25 years before he was eligible for parole and was sent to serve his time in the maximum security prison in Renew, New Brunswick. Darren Muse pleaded guilty to second-degree murder. He was also given a life sentence, but was to be eligible for parole after serving 20 years. At Muse's sentencing, Justice F.B. William Kelly said, quote, Muse cut Burroughs' throat, thereby accelerating death, an act which could by itself have caused death if untreated. As can be seen from the autopsy report, this was not a single cut. There was additionally a stabbing component. He did not sever a major vessel, but he worked at it. His claim that he acted out of mercy is outrageous. That claim speaks volumes concerning Muse's character. And he continues, Unlike many murder cases, there is no suggestion of intoxication or provocation or self-defense. Muse's killing of Neil Burroughs is, in the context of all the facts, at least as serious as many first-degree murder cases. The three accused were sober, acting with purpose and intention, and they brutally eliminated the witnesses. Not a scintilla of compassion was extended. End quote. Darren Muse's lawyer, Joel E. Pink, a well-known Halifax defense attorney, was later quoted speaking about whether he thought Darren Muse was an evil person. He said, quote, In the minds of a lot of people, Muse was evil, observes Pink. But Darren Muse is not an evil person. Yes, he was there at the robbery. But he didn't do the shootings. Yes, he was there to do a theft. Did he try to stab someone in the head? Yes. Did he try to cover it up? Yes. But if you study this, he was not a psychopath. If you ask me, did he cry in my presence? Yes, he did. He was very upset about the whole situation. End quote. Yeah, upset for himself that he'd been caught and had to face the consequences. Wow. So that's the defense's argument. <laughs> <laughs> yep. Well, okay. To give the lawyer his due, mm -hmm. you have to vigorously defend. You do. No matter, and, yep. and he, the poor guy is probably left grasping at straws on how to mitigate this for his client, right? Yeah. Yeah. And, uh, you know, Justice Kelly already kind of addressed all this, yeah. you know, yeah. saying, well, he didn't have to do any of the things that he did, which no. landed him in jail, you no. know, so. God, stupid kid. Darren Muse served his 20 years and moved toward release by first being granted escorted temporary absences, working outside the Laval, Quebec prison where he was being held in 2007. In 2011, he received day parole, and in 2012, Darren Muse was granted full parole. He was deemed a low risk to reoffend, but he could not consume any drugs and had to stay away from people involved in criminality. He was also not to contact Arlene McNeil, 
her family, or the families of the other victims, and he was to stay away from Sydney, Nova Scotia. According to a Global News article from 2017, Darren Muse is financially secure and living a good life on parole here in British Columbia. Rumor is he came into some money after an inheritance. I don't want him to be living in British Columbia. Right. Like, we're too good for him. I don't know if that's the case. I don't think we're too good for anybody, but... But, come on, like, it's like, I'm... Ooh, good for you, Darren. Glad you didn't do the shootings. You're only involved in robbery and murder via stabbing. Yeah, right. Glad to see you're living a good life. When yeah. you destroyed so many others. Well, and I, I always come back to think about Arlene. Arlene yeah. McNeil. And, um... We, we talk, I talk a little bit more about what happened I, to her. I, I don't know if, I don't know if I would want to go on if I was in the situation she was in. This is always a personal choice, but mm-hmm. I, I've don't, t- I don't know if I could. I've talked to a few people yeah. about this uh, situation and they've all said the same thing. Yeah. You know, but she did. Yeah. And uh, I'll just tell you now what happened to her. Okay. In August of 2018, after a battle with breast cancer, Arlene McNeil passed away. Her wounds had confined her to a wheelchair, and she spent many of the years after the crime at Peter's Place in Pleasantville, Nova Scotia, just outside Bridgewater. Peter's Place is a rehabilitation center providing physical and cognitive rehabilitation for individuals with acquired brain injury. The organization is committed to empowering individuals in their programs to attain their highest level of independence and quality of life. By providing a wide range of support services, the program ensures successful community living with the least restrictive environment possible. Their sole focus is rehabilitation of the brain-injured individual. All programs and activities are designed with participant input. You can learn more at petersplace.ca. I just feel so... I feel bad for the victims that died. Yeah. But I kind of feel worse for her in a weird way. Because she, she had the, the suffering was just extended. Right. You know? Yeah. The people who died, I mean, obviously their families suffer. Yeah. So we feel badly for their families and the people who love them and cared for them and the community. But Arlene is a different situation. Mm. Her life was taken that day. Yeah. She had uh, designs on going to university and getting her business administration degree and right. like, doing all the things that a normal... She was moving forward in life. Yeah, exactly. She yeah. was saving up her money to go to school and she wanted to move forward. She was she was a pretty girl. Yeah. Um, Horrible. But yeah, like all of those things were removed from her Yeah. at that point in time when... Twitbird mm. shot her, you know, like I'm, I'm, you know, I'm hoping that she had moments of joy and happiness with family, even though she's in the situation. I'm and, sure she did. And that, um, you know, and I, I wouldn't judge anyone, obviously, totally everyone's situation, but I, I don't know if I, she did have that. people who loved her. Yeah. yeah. You know, her, her folks loved her. Yeah. And uh, cared for her the best they could. For them as well. Yeah. Like, I just, I just feel so bad for her. Mm-hmm. Ugh. As of this telling, Freeman McNeil and Derek Wood are still behind bars. Although Wood has made many appeals for his release, he's been refused to this point as his caretakers indicate a fear he might reoffend. So this episode is really leaving me cold, Mike. Yeah. I like to have like some good reason of either like, you know, okay, he was insane, so it was insanity and it was true, or there was a love triangle and it was the heat of the moment, or, but this one, it just seems so, like this is the most senseless one that we've done. Yep, I agree. Totally senseless. Like, and I can't imagine being the families of these people mm-hmm. where the, there's just a senseless, total senselessness to it. Yeah, I, and I don't understand the thinking that gets you to the point when you're 18 and 23 years old where you think that robbing, again, robbing the McDonald's that you work in is a good idea. But at the same time, I do recall a crime of a similar ilk mm. that happened in my hometown. 
right. in the early 1990s. And uh, they were kids that I knew that perpetrated the crime. What'd they do? They went into a convenience store to rob it with a shotgun. And luckily, the shop owner had the wherewithal to realize, wait a minute, that's a broken shotgun. Right. Like, it's not going to work. I'm not getting shot here. Mm -hmm. So he beat the crap out of the guys with a golf club. Good. Yeah. Like, they got beaten with a golf club. Then, after that, they got charged and sent to jail. Good. And one of them, right before he was about to get out of jail escaped from custody. So you're in a minimum security prison because armed robbery is not murder. So eventually you're moved to a minimum security prison. And this guy just walked away and it was like a month or weeks from... Why would you do that? That's a great question. <laughs> People are more. That is a great question. So he ended up back in with more time because he had escaped. He had almost served his full term. Wow. So it's not even a parole situation where he's going to get out and get on parole. He had almost served his full term, walks away from the prison, and ends up back inside. Like, uh... It's something just occurred to me. Mm -hmm. If you do your full sentence, you're not on parole when you leave. No, you're not. You just leave. Yeah, yeah it just it, for some reason I just thought, oh, they just watch you for a while even after you've... No, but if you've done your th thing, that's you've you've paid your paid your due to society, right? Yeah, okay. but I I digress. So back to motive. Yeah, those guys, what the motive was? Well, they were bored, and they'd seen a few movies where people get do those kind of things, and they wanted to see what it was like to see if they could get away with it. So, but these they knew these people. Mm hmm. I, I have. Right? They didn't even have the, you know, it's total stranger, so life doesn't matter because I don't know them. Mm -hmm. you know, if not, not that that's an excuse, but like they knew this is a small town and they worked with these people. Yep. Horrible. Well, the same situation in my hometown. So, yeah, yeah it's just very weird. Uh, it was a weird time back there. Things were depressed and people were feeling really hopeless. And I'm not making an excuse for those guys, why they did the things that they did, but I think it might have contributed to their mindset. Is the economy better on the East Coast now? Um, things are improving. Mm. It's really hard to find a place to live that's affordable now because people are taking their money from here in BC and moving back. And so... In Toronto, lots of places, yeah, because it's, I guess with COVID, it's like, hey, you know, we're kind of at home all the time, so why live in a really expensive city? Yeah, so real estate prices are skyrocketing, <laughs> making it really tough for somebody who is new to even find an apartment, is having a hard, uh, are people who are new, even just to get an apartment, are having a hard time wow. finding a place to live. Who would so. have thunk? Right? Nova Scotia. Yeah. But that's, that's the way it is. It seems that way across Canada now. I mean, there are still places where you can buy a house for, you know, a hundred, a hundred grand if you want to, but typically those are the places that but nobody wants really to cold. live. <laughs> yeah, exactly. So I don't know. It looked like, I don't want to sound like an old fuddy duddy and an old grump, but it, I think our economy is screwed. <laughs> It just seems that way. It just seems like, you know, we're having trouble with supply chain. People aren't able to, you know, not willing to go back the, to work. The real estate prices are insane in Canada. Yeah. Like, like I look at prices in America. Yeah. And I'm like, wow. Oh. What, what can you give for a million dollars in the United States compared to a million dollars here? A lot. It's, it's incredible. And yeah. It's just so weird. I mean, yeah. Anyway. That's a whole other podcast, I think. Yeah. But that's it for Dark Poutine episode 203, the Sydney River McDonald shooting. And boy, am I ever glad to move on to voicemails after that one. Yes. That's right. It's time for voicemails. You can leave us a message at 1-877-327-5786 or 1-877-DARK-PTN. We'd love to hear from you. Let's see who called us this week. All right, here is our first call. Hey, Mike and Matt. I know this isn't going to get played on the show, um, 
so I just listened to your most recent episode, which was, I must say, very well done. Uh, that's the end of, uh, yeah, that's my little compliment there. Um, I actually wanted to ask a question about um, your discourse on forgiveness and resentment. It, it came at an interesting time for me in my life. Um, briefly, I was sexually abused as a child by my father and um, spent a lot of time getting over, well, processing and whatnot uh, during my adolescence. And I've actually gotten in touch with my paternal grandfather recently, and he actually mentioned something about forgiveness to me not all that long ago. So, um, yeah, uncanny to hear that discussion. And what struck me is you mentioning forgiving your own monster. And I don't know. I guess my question is, how? You know, I, I would be, um, if it's something you'd ever discuss, I'd be very interested to hear how you arrived on there. Um, your prerogative, where, you know, if you want to share that part of your journey, I, this is something I obviously need to talk about with my therapist, but um, I just wanted to say thank you for being candid about that and for, I don't know, it's just it's interesting to hear how people process these things. Um, in any case, that's the end of my voicemail message. Thank you again for everything you guys do. Been listening to you guys since day one and since before I moved up here from uh, Bellingham, Washington, and I'm now in Nanaimo. All right. That's one for the voicemail archives. Go shit in your puke, eh? <laughs> so, yeah, that's he sent another voicemail after saying his name was Caleb and apologizing for sending this one because he thought... I apologize for that. Well, I think the apology had to do with um, bringing out some very personal things for me, but I'm fine talking about it. And yeah. and you're wrong, Caleb. We did play this on the show because um, I, I hear somebody who's in pain, you know? I'm sorry that happened to you, Caleb. Yeah. It is... Uh, Forgiveness is a tough thing, and the way I went about forgiving the person who uh, did that to me, it wasn't my father. I didn't have a relationship with that person at all, before or after. So maybe my forgiveness was a little easier than what you have to process. I don't know. Uh, it's different. But I wrote about it a lot. I've talked about it a lot. I've, you know, given this guy to the universe. You know, there is, there is something in the universe, I believe, that takes care of us all. I don't, I don't want to get into it. That's, that's very personal. And, but for my own spiritual health, I had to come to a place where I don't let this person own me anymore because that guy owned me and my thoughts for years my anger at him owned me and I was allowing him to rent all the space in my head for free. And now I have let him go. Let, you know, let the universe take care of him. The police are aware. I have done all the things in, to put in place what I need to do. I haven't been able to confront the guy because... I've been told not to, so, you know, I would tell him how I felt. I still felt the things that I felt, and I felt the anger, and I felt the fear that this person uh, put into me by traumatizing me. So, yeah, if you want to have an, an email discussion with me, Caleb, feel free. Uh, dark team podcast at gmail.com and you and I will have some back and forth about this because uh, yeah it's a tough thing it is not an easy thing and that resentment that anger will kill people I've seen it kill people and you don't deserve to die because of something somebody else did anyway that's my two cents on that Matthew, do you have anything? No, no. I yeah. think um, it's, uh, you know, I haven't had this situation, but I've had to forgive mm -hmm. for other things. And you just kind of, um, I don't know how to say it. You just, how do you forgive was this question. It's kind of, well, 
you forgive. Yeah. You know, it's, it's hard, but yeah. I, I, I Every time it comes into my, it would come into my head. I would just say, think to myself, go. I need to let this go. Yeah. I did a um, paper burning thing. So mm-hmm. I, I wrote my resentments towards somebody on a piece of paper. Yep. And, um, lit it on fire and mm-hmm. just let it sort of, cause this person was already gone, dead. And just sort of let it sort of go to the universe. I did some, I just find something sort of, it sounds weird, but doing something that's sort of representational yeah. has helped me let go of some things. Well, it, you have to accept the unacceptable. So you have to accept that that happened, number one. So this awful thing happened. I accept that. I had to. Yeah. So where do you go after you accept that that happened? Well, I mean, anger is a part of the process to letting things go, but a lot of us get stuck in it, you know? So there's that old adage, and I think we've said it many times before, resentment is like drinking poison and hope the other person dies. Yeah. You know? So just not drink the poison. Yeah. Every time that it comes into your brain, just say, no, this is, this is not something I need to think about anymore. I just don't feel the feelings. Sure. Mm. But the thought, those intrusive thoughts are what were the the hardest thing to let go of. Yeah. Was that, uh, questioning and why and, uh, and and none of that is really ever going to get answered. So. You got to do what you can do. Look at your part in things and your part in things is holding on to the anger. The truth is there is no why people do people things, right? Yeah. And unfortunately it happens to some of us and not to others. And Mm -hmm. there's nothing that, um, you know, when you're in that situation, there's nothing that you were or did. Yeah. Um, It's just, you know. So feel free, Caleb, like I said, to reach out to me. Yeah, do I do that. Let's listen to another voicemail. Hey, Dr. Teen. This is Maddie from Cambridge, Ontario. Not long ago, y'all's name caught my eye on Spotify. I found it quite funny, so I actually clicked on it, which I don't often do. Well, I got hooked very fast, (laughs) and I've been listening ever since. Though I'm born and raised in Ontario, my blood is firmly from the Maritimes, so I've always felt connected to the way that you might talk about Nova Scotia, and I've always found it to be one of the most endearing parts of this podcast. Anyway, in the time that I've been listening, I have had to stop myself from calling many times because I didn't want to call with the old co-host. So now I can happily say, hi, Matthew, you are a fantastic addition to this podcast. (laughs) And I just wanted to tell you both how much I enjoy this podcast and thank you for all the care you put into highlighting victims. For a while now, I've been wondering if you'd ever do an away game for Madeline McCain, because I'm not sure (sighs) if you, (laughs) sorry, I'm not sure if you would consider it to be one that's too popular to do Mm -hmm. but I do really think that you could do that case great justice I'd love to hear your take on it as it's a case that has always stuck with me since I was about 11 years old when I googled my own name for the first time and found a picture of a sweet little girl who not only shared my name but who looked a lot like I did at age five and she's only a few years younger than I am I've never forgotten her since then, and I've always hoped she'd defy the odds and turn up safe, you know? But regardless, I would love to hear, even if you'd consider doing it on the podcast. And yeah, I guess go shit in your hat, boys. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) Thank you, Maddie from Cambridge. Yeah, there you go. Um, yeah, much appreciated on the uh, the kudos and all that kind of stuff. And gotcha with my name, <laughs> Dark Routine. Yeah. We reeled you in. Yeah. <laughs> Sucked, fished in, fished in. <laughs> but uh, yeah, uh, Madeline McCann is actually one that I have put on my away game list. And Matthew made a little bit of a grunt when uh, we, were, we were talking about it, just because uh, I think he was living in the UK, so he's probably heard it to death. Yeah, it was, um, it, it was big globally, but mm-hmm. in the UK, it was 
incessant. Yeah. And it's just one of these things where, um, like, I get it, and yeah. and I I think I know what happened. Okay. Um, this is why we should do it, Matthew. But um, it was it was it was one of those times where, like, I felt for her and the family, but I got coverage f- fatigue about this story. Yeah. I just got fatigued from the story, and a lot of people did yeah. and have, and so that's why I've sort of left things like this story yeah. away. Uh, it's why I don't do a, an away game on Ted Bundy. How many more Ted Bundy podcasts do we need to hear? I am very interested in that story. Mm-hmm. Uh, living very close to Washington state. Um, I am super interested in the places I've been to the places where it happened. But for me to do a podcast about Ted Bundy, what am I adding to the to the conversation. Not much. I'm just sort of telling that story that you've heard over and over and over again. So the Madeline McCann case is a little bit like that, but I think it has some aspects that are really human and especially the accusatory stuff that went on Mm. around her parents and all that kind of stuff. I think it would make a fascinating thing for us to dive into. Mm. So. So when are we going to do it? Uh, it'll be probably a, <laughs> quite a ways away, <laughs> okay. but it's, it's on the list, but it's, it's not like, it's not like something I have scheduled to do. Okay. Yeah. Anyway, next voicemail. Let's listen to this one. Two minutes and 32 seconds. Who on earth calls for that long? My mother. <laughs> 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 this is the best call that we've ever had. Yeah, I guess so. Like, so. I haven't heard a busy signal in years. Do you want to play that for two minutes? No, I'm minutes? not going to play that for two minutes. Uh, <laughs> so yeah, <laughs> I guess somebody called. Thanks for calling. Thanks for calling and hanging up. I have your phone number, so I'm about to call you back. No, I'm just kidding. Can you imagine? We should do that sometime. Just, hi, just just randomly call somebody who's, who's called in live on air. Yeah, just say, hey, you called in and you left a really rude voicemail. <laughs> and we want to have a conversation with you right now. Is that okay? Some people don't like that I use the word dick, it seems. <laughs> you don't, it, yeah. Let's call her. <laughs> no. All right, there's one more. Let's listen to this one. Hi, Mike. Hi, Matthew. This is Annie calling from Portage and Maine in Winnipeg and Manitoba. Wanted to call in and give you a few notes. You talked about Portage in Maine and the Underground Passage. There are entrances at several intersections and buildings around Portage in Maine, but right under Portage in Maine is kind of a human roundabout, which is officially called the Circus. It's a perfectly round walkway with drop-offs at all the high-rises at the intersection. On either side of the Circus are straighter sections with shopping and services. Fun fact, that video of the man pooping in the planter was filmed in the underground at one of the building turnoffs. So that was a really good segue and completely on point. In regards to why there are no pedestrian corridors outside the street level, it's actually not about the cold. It's about traffic. Somewhere along the line, some planners decided they didn't want to allow pedestrians crossing because of the traffic. It might be unsafe. It's four streets with turning lanes. And also the traffic lights if people crossed at street level. The lights would need to be red longer, and that would be inconvenient to all the commuters trying to get back to their suburban homes. The argument also being that no one lives downtown or walks downtown, so the cars are given priority over pedestrians. I live downtown. I walk everywhere downtown. So go shit in your hat, or if you don't have a hat, maybe you can poop in an obliging planter. Thank you so much for your wonderful podcast. I will continue to listen. <laughs> oh, my goodness. Oh, Annie, we love you. Uh, this is Annie, the civil engineer calling. I know. That's awesome. Yeah. So I, I love that. I love I love that they pronounce it portage instead of portage. I mean, but yeah, I mean, to, it was funny. I, I'd stopped by at a colleague's house on the way here today. Mm-hmm. Um, and uh, somebody said something about the, they're grumbling about the bicycle lanes that are putting being put downtown Vancouver, right? Yeah. And I said, the only people that bitch about them are people that don't live downtown. 
sometimes. <laughs> right? It's true. It's my neighborhood, and and I think Annie's Annie's a city dweller t- as well. And and you know there, there used to be this old saying in like the nineteen fifties, right? A, a city built for speed is a city built for success. Well, well, that's not the case, right? You, you need livable space and crossable streets. So mm-hmm. you know, don't get me wrong. I you know how much I love the peg. I don't know why, but I do. I just love the peg. Mm-hmm. Um, but yeah, the circus. That is what it's called, the circus. But yeah. Um, Thanks, Annie. <laughs> yep, it was a great it was a great voicemail. I, we had a it. bit of a giggle too. Loved it. That's it for this week's voicemails. Again, you can leave us one at one eight seven seven three two seven five seven eight six or one eight seven seven D A R K P T N. We'd love to hear from you, even if it is just to say hi and to tell us to go shit in our hats. If you're stumped for what to chat with us about, a quick story is welcome. So let's move on to Patreon. And uh, just to pull, to pull back the curtain a little bit, we haven't really recorded a show since early December. Because we were going on Christmas. Because and, we were going. And we didn't want to leave you guys high and dry. Exactly. And I needed a vacation from my vacation after. <laughs> he needed a vacation from me. <laughs> no, I didn't need a vacation from you. But I did need a vacation from the vacation that I took because being around family I love my family, dearly, dearly love my family, but it's like Matthew mentioned to me. Uh, Ram Dass. Yeah, what Ram Dass said. Can you? If you think you've achieved spiritual enlightenment, spend a week with your family. Exactly. With your parents. Yeah. Exactly. So it's not that my parents <laughs> did anything wrong or anything while we were there. They're just being parents. But they're just being parents and I'm not used to being parented anymore. <laughs> <laughs> I'm used to even, being like... Even though you need it. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> I definitely need it. Anyway, so let's move on to Patreon. And first up, from someplace I'm not quite sure of, is Amber McMullen. And where is Amber from, Matthew? Amber lives r- really close to the Nazca Lines in Peru. What is that? You know, those visible from the air drawings of animals? Oh, okay. Those are really cool. Yeah. So she lives there. I want to see those like, uh, from the air, number one. So I want to go on a helicopter there because seeing them on the ground is a whole different. And that's what she does. She's a helicopter pilot to, to tour. Are they, what, are they called petroglyphs? I think that's what they're called. Yeah. Yeah. If they're carved into rock, I believe they're petroglyphs. Okay. Anyway. Uh, well, thank you. And what does she do there? She she flies the helicopter to her. Well, there you go. That answers that question. <laughs> Next up, we have... Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> we have someone named Rob and last initial M from Windsor, Ontario. Ah. Rob M from Windsor, Ontario. Rob M. Yeah. Right across the, from uh, South Detroit. South Detroit. <laughs> you remember that? Yeah, I do. South Detroit. Yes. So oh dear. Th- what does Rob do? Well, I'm curious what he does. I think he works for one of the auto manufacturers. Of course he does. If he yeah. if he's in Windsor, probably that's the case. Or the casino. Oh, really? Is there a casino there? Yes. I've never been. I don't do casinos much. Although we are doing a casino. Oh, drum roll, please. Speaking <laughs> of casino segues, from April 29th until May 1st, Matthew and Michael me and him, will be in Las Vegas, Nevada at CrimeCon with our own table. <laughs> Viva Las Vegas, baby! So if you go to CrimeCon.com to get your ticket, you can use the code POUTINE for... P-O-U-T-I-N-E. For 10% off your standard ticket. And so, which is, I mean, honestly, at twice the price to meet us, it's a deal. Right. <laughs> it's true. But I'm looking forward to going back to Vegas. I'm so excited about this. And Matthew and I are going to have a good time in Vegas. And my podcast husband, Tyler, is going to be there as well. You know, last time I was in Vegas, it was a Mr. Universe competition. I didn't know that. Oh, dear. And I was like hanging out by the pool. I stayed in that horrible hotel that's like the pyramid. Mm Mm-hmm. Yep. Yep. Horrible hotel. But like all these like muscle, I'm like, wow, is Ve-? I'm like, I thought everyone in Vegas looked like this, but it was like an, a global, like Mr. Muscle competition. Oh, hilarious. we'll probably be in the Paris this time. So we're going to stay oh, that's a nice the Paris one. Hotel. Yeah. And that they have the best buffet. 
yeah in the morning all, well i don't gamble and i don't drink so yeah it's yeah. gonna be food yeah it's gonna we're gonna have a good time yeah so there you go um awesome so <laughs> i got totally lost what i was doing <laughs> You're getting old. So, R- Rob, you think works at the casino? I th- either that or the or the auto. Yeah, auto thing could do. Next, we have Lisa George, and Lisa is from Saint Eugene, Ontario. Hmm. Yeah. And what does Lisa do there in Saint Eugene, Ontario? Or it looks French, so it might be Saint Eugene. It's Ontario, it's St. Eugene. Okay. Uh, I think she runs a, what are those things called? I don't, you have to give me a little more. Old train station. Okay. I think. Uh, a I depot? Th- yeah, the train depot. I think she made it into a, a museum and she runs a train museum. Oh, well, that's good. Yeah. That's nice. One of my dad's toy trains from when he was a little boy was in the uh, rail museum in Nova Scotia. Oh. Yeah. Fun fact. Cool. Uh, next we have from somewhere I'm not sure of, Angela Kerr. Now, where's Angela from? Goblin Valley State Park, oh. U- Utah. Wow. Wow. Yeah. That sounds like a place I want to go because couple, there has to be goblins. A couple hundred miles southeast of Salt Lake City. Mm-hmm. And for lots of this is sat, uh, soft sandstone, say that 10 times fast. And it's been eroded by the wind and it actually, supposedly the, the pillars, if you will, look like goblins. Yeah. I knew that's why they oh, called you? them goblins. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Let's go. Hey, is Utah close to Las Vegas? Utah is very close to Vegas. I do believe so is Arizona. Why don't, it, it, why don't we drive down? Oh God. Road tour. I don't know if my little car would make it. Mm, well, rent one. No, no. I don't want to rent a car there. Take but... Steve. We could take Steve to Las Vegas with us. <laughs> that would be so awesome. Oh gosh. Um, so what does Angela do there in Goblin Valley? Like, well, there's lots of goblins. She runs a diner. Oh, yeah. yeah. I like diners. One of those cool metal old ones. Oh. Yeah. Uh, wow. So we have somebody who is a patron from... PX, PXAMACI, 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 Finland. And I hope I'm pronouncing it correctly because there's umlauts over the A's. There's no way you're pronouncing it. There's no way I'm pronouncing it correctly, but uh, Taro Tikkanen. Hello, Taro Tikkanen. Yeah. And Tikkanen, uh, uh, there's lots of hockey players named Tikkanen. So I wonder if Taro Tikkanen is a hockey player. I think they are. Yeah. Professional Finnish yes. league plays for their team Finland. Um, actually I think for team Canada. Oh, wow. Yeah. Really? Yeah. Did a little transfer over here. Hmm. Interesting. So why still living in, in Finland and transferred to. So it's a long commute. Just a mailing address, I guess. Yeah. Well, <laughs> thank you so much <laughs> for playing hockey for team thank Canada. Thank you. Uh, and here's a funny, I don't know if this is your fir- real first name, but I know this is your real last name. It's Huyen Nguyen. So isn't it interesting that I knew how to pronounce that last name? It's N-G-E-U-Y-E-N, and it's pronounced Nguyen. I've known some Nguyens. Yeah. But the reason I know that is because... Episode. I had a person named uh, Janet who worked for me. Oh, yeah. I, th- I thought you did. Yeah, an she's an actress in Ontario. Oh, right I now. thought you did an episode where there was a new Yin as well. I might have. Okay, but yeah. So I don't know where Huyen Nguyen lives. Chocolate Hills of the Bahol Island in the Philippines. Well, that sounds like fun. Yeah. Chocolate Hills are the hills actually made of chocolate? Well, the the foliage goes from lush green to brown during the dry season. Oh, and well. um, but yeah, so. Ian runs a chocolate factory there. Well, there you go. Mm-hmm. <laughs> it's instead of Charlie in the chocolate chocolate factory, it's Huyen Nguyen in the chocolate factory. Chocolate Hills forever. <laughs> I watched that movie last night. There you go. Yesterday. Have you seen it? Which one? 
yesterday. Oh, it's such a good movie. I thought it'd be bad. It was. It's like, very it, sweet. It was sweet and really nice. Yeah, I did like Across the Universe too. Did have you ever seen no, that one? No. Uh, that's another one with, with a lot of singing of Beatles songs. Okay, it's 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 not quite as good as Yesterday. It's not quite as cute. Mm. But uh, Yesterday, in my opinion, is at the the tippy top of the Beatles tribute movies. Yeah, it was a good one. I, yeah. I enjoyed it. And last up from, again, somewhere I'm not sure of, for as far as patrons go, we have Russ Smith. Well, Russ, thank you for having a very easy name to pronounce. Russ, Russ, Smith. Russ Smith. Smith. Yep. Uh, where's Russ from? Do you know where the hand in the desert is in Chile? I don't. Okay, so there's a Chilean sculptor, Mario Irazable, um, created this, uh, it's essentially in the middle of the Atacama Desert. Wow. And there's this hand that comes out of the desert, and Russ lives um, behind the hand. Behind the hand? Yeah. Wow, that's interesting. So what does Russ do there, uh, where he lives behind the hand in the desert? He looks after the hand. He looks... <laughs> Well, you know, someone's going to look after the hand. Yeah. As long as they're not talking to the hand. <laughs> talk to the hand, Russ. Yeah, that's what, he just tells people to talk to the Thank hand. Thank you, Russ. Thank you, everybody, for helping with Patreons. Absolutely. Uh, so we did get some donut money. Yay. And it looks like a, quite a few people... Uh, ponied up some donut money, which was Good. really, really nice. Uh, especially this time of year is particularly hard because Patreon goes down. People are trying to pay their bills from Christmas and they realize, well, I'm still with Dark Poutine. I should probably ditch them for a while. Yeah, I get it. Right? And then some don't come back. I get it. You know, after yeah. Christmas, always a little bit tight, isn't it? Exactly. Yeah. So we understand. Uh, but we have Emily Matty's Designs sent us some donut money, and she says, I love you both so much. Enjoy some donuts, Nanaimo bars, or even some butter tarts. S stay happy and safe over the holidays. Oh, so, thank you. Yeah, so there, that sort of indicates that we haven't done this for a while. Thank you. <laughs> thank you, Emily. But and butter tarts are my favorite of all I wonder things. what she designs. What does Emily design, Matthew? What did she design? Yeah, because it's Emily Matty's design. So Inter interstellar spacecraft. Well, there you go. And where does she do that? Probably Houston. We have a problem. No, Lake Hillier, Western Australia. Oh, okay. Yeah, there you go. I was way off. You know where that pink uh, island is in Australia? Oh, that bright pink island. No, I don't. Do you like the sticker on my head? I do. Matthew's got like the outside of a dark routine sticker on his forehead do I because like, he's got a big. I feel forehead. like I look like a robot. You do look like a robot. The one from, um, oh, what's that one? Red Dwarf. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, Angela Barnes, our friend from the Yumber Yard, Hi, sent Angela. us some money and she says, Merry Christmas, guys. Get Steve something as well. Well, Steve gets a lot of things as well. Steve uh, is, is. I will get him one of his favorite shoe sticks. Okay. That's a good idea. Yeah. And again, we have another happy Christmas from a longtime listener, uh, Jamie Whittlesley. Well, hello, Jamie. And Jamie is from Abbotsford. And what does Jamie do? In Abbotsford? Yeah. She commutes into Vancouver and complains about the uh, cycling lanes. There you go. That's a good, <laughs> somebody's got to do it. <laughs> All right. That's where the airport is. Isn't it? The Abbotsford airport. That's correct. Uh, Janessa Lowe from South Maitland, Nova Scotia. Wow. Uh, one of my homies. Yeah. Uh, Jess, Janessa Lowe says, love this podcast, Canada. I love Exclamation that name, Janessa. Point. Janessa is a good name. That's a cool name. Yeah. And what does Janessa do there in South Maitland, Nova Scotia? I think, I don't know, but I think she should run the Nova Scotian chapter of the Dark Poutine Fan Club. Well, she could. Yeah. I think my... Mother has that cornered because she's going to bookstores and telling people, my son is the author of this Aww. book. <laughs> you know, is she? It's quite cute. Uh, next we have. I gave your book to lots of people. For oh, Christmas. really? Yeah. Yeah. Well, I appreciate that. 
And people, please keep doing that because <laughs> eventually I'll get paid. Sonia Lechner. Sonia. I don't know where Sonia's from. With, uh, well, Sonia, is that a French name? It could be. It's spelled with an I and not a Y, so it sounds French. Okay. I think she's from uh, the Côte d'Azur. Oh, wow. Yeah. Okay. And what does she do Actually, on I'll... the Ivory Coast? Look at me, no, I'm a French. The Côte d'Azur is not no, Ivory Coast. It's the Azure, it's the Blue Coast, isn't it? <laughs> she lives in Antibes. Oh, oh, I don't know any of these hey, things. Antibes is halfway between Nice and Cannes. Wow, I'm just confused. It's a little village, it's beautiful. Okay. And I think she runs a little, uh, you know, you can sit outside, have a pichet of rosé and some local fish. Nice. Yeah. Irene Brienne is back again. Hello, with Irene Brienne. Saying, get the humans and Master Steve sweet holiday treats Aww, from the Brienne family. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, next we have, whoa. Who's whoa? Melissa and Taya. Hi, Melissa and Taya. And, and I don't know where Melissa's from either. You don't know where Melissa's from? No. Why not? Did she not say where she's from? No, she doesn't say where she's from, I which mean, is confusing. So Matthew, you're the one who's supposed to know these things. I do. She's from Florida. Oh, Florida. Florida person. Yeah, she's from Florida. And so what does uh, Melissa do there in Florida? She works at the Salvador Dali Museum. Is there a Salvador Dali Museum in Florida? There is. Why would Florida be the place with the Salvador Cause, Dali Museum? Because some rich dude had a bunch of them. Oh, I gotcha. Yeah. Yeah, and just wanted a place to display them. Yeah. Yeah, that makes sense. So here here we go. This one is a bit of a long one, and it's from Ryan Lamperts. And Ryan is from Winnipeg, Manasnoba, he says. <laughs> <laughs> long time listener here, sending you warmth from Winterpeg, Manaso Manasnoba. <laughs> oh, boy. I had a little extra money in my PayPal account oh. and felt you deserved it. Thanks for all the work you put into ep each episode of the show. Take good care and go shit in your hat. So there you go. Thank you, Ryan. Yeah. Uh, much appreciated, Ryan. And we got the other part of your message as well that you didn't want us to read <laughs> on the air, but thank you so much. You're a good egg, Ryan Lamperts. You can tell me what it says later. Yeah. I will tell you what thank it you, says Ryan. later. Because Matthew gets the inside. He's not complaining about me, is he? No. Okay, good. <laughs> <laughs> oh, well, okay. Matthew, uh, douchebag. Uh, <laughs> I've been called worse. <laughs> as long as you're using my name, I'm happy. <laughs> yeah. Blah, 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 blah. I don't want this guy on the show. Blah, blah. Anyway. Uh, Every second week I give Mike the opportunity to fire me and he hasn't yet. <laughs> no. <laughs> Matthew, Matthew says... He always sends me a message every couple of weeks saying, am I still on the show? <laughs> and of course you are. I'm just not to everybody's taste. Man. Well, you know what? To hell with those people. <laughs> because that other guy wasn't to my taste and is not <laughs> anymore. Oh, Goblin Valley. When somebody hurts your feelings, they really hurt your feelings and you don't need them in your life anymore. I really want to go to Goblin Valley with you, Mike. Yeah, well, we should go to Goblin Valley. I can't get over Valley. that. I really want to do that. It is, it is cool. There's also Red Rocks, which is closer yeah. to Las Vegas. That is very, very cool. Carol and I went last time we were there. We should take a few extra days and tour. Could do. Road tour. Yeah, if you want to, we can. Me and you in a red we convertible. Can, we can do that. We can do an away game from down there. Red convertible. I had a blue convertible the last time I was there. But red ones go faster. Yeah, apparently. And they also attract police for tickets. <laughs> yeah, I used to have a red car and got a lot of tickets. <laughs> yeah, you? it was because the car was red. It wasn't because my foot was heavy. It was, it was the when car. When I got pulled over and got a $200 ticket in the States because of you, I was in a red car. Oh, right. You yeah. did get a, you blame on me. Yeah. Why? Like I blame your, I blame your podcast and the car. Oh, okay. Yeah. Because I was stressed. I was like freaking out, listening, and didn't realize how fast I was going. Well, there you have it. <laughs> anyway, that is it for voicemails and Donut Money donors. Thanks, y'all. Uh, thank you to all our patrons and Donut Money donors, past and present, for your generosity. It helps to keep the show going. You can become a patron of Dark Poutine at patreon.com 
slash dark poutine for a one-time donation you can send us donut money via paypal using our email dark poutine podcast at gmail.com and there's no limit on how much you can send via paypal there's not <laughs> if you don't already <laughs> subscribe to the show it would mean a lot if you did you can easily find dark poutine on apple Podcasts, spotify or wherever you listen to your favorite podcasts if you haven't gotten yours yet my book Murder, Madness, and Mayhem is available via an order link at the Dark Poutine website. And speaking of our website, please check out darkpoutine.com for show notes and other cool stuff. Please take the time to give Dark Poutine a like or a follow on Facebook and Instagram. Most importantly, thank you for listening and tell your friends about us. Word of mouth is a powerful thing. And uh, yeah, I guess that's it. Until we return. <laughs> We're out of here. Don't forget to be a good egg and not a bad apple. Bye, kids. Bye. Hi, it's Shauna, and I might be a bad parent because my kids think french fries are vegetables. Hey, it's Ryan, and I might be a bad parent because I went out for wings when my wife was in the hospital after giving birth. Johnny here. I might be a bad parent because in my house, the tooth fairy gives pocket change. But we're not alone. Len emailed us and said his six-year-old daughter's Tarzan moment going from love seat to lazy boy by curtains made him more proud than any dance <laughs> recital. <laughs> and Andy left his two-year-old at the rink. All right, guys, I'm sure we're not alone. Like Andy's kid. <laughs> For stories and confessions like this, make sure you check out our podcast. It's called Bad Parents, and it's available wherever you get your podcasts. I left a glove at the ring.